Part one. Just under 10 years ago, I began my career as a curator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Uh, this was in the summer of 2007, and I got settled into my new job, and within the first week, I wanted to go visit the North American Indian Cultures Hall. Uh, this hall was uh, finished in 1978 and takes the visitor on a tour of North America through the lens of Native Americans. And so I started in the Northwest Coast and headed down California into the Great Basin. And when I got to the Southwest, I stopped dead in my tracks because when I got to the section on the Hopi Indians, I looked up and I found this mannequin sitting down staring at me. And he struck me as slightly disheveled, uh, perhaps even a little bit veering towards crazy. And I immediately went back down to my office and picked up the phone and called the collections manager, Isabel Tovar. And I said, I'm the new curator. Do I have the authority to decide what the content of this new, of this exhibit hall is? And she said, yes, that's within your purview. And so we went and got a ladder, and we then um, took down the uh, mannequin, which I saw as not just a mannequin, but a dummy in the sense of uh, how this individual was sitting there, kind of wordless. He was present, but absent. He was essentially mute. So we went and took him down. And I felt pretty satis self-satisfied using my new curatorial authority to make such a quick decision. But as I familiarized myself with the exhibit hall, I realized that the entire hall had all kinds of predicaments. When I stopped and studied the Clinket and Inupiat sections, I saw these mannequins that were kind of vague and almost like ghosts. Uh, they struck me as individuals that were presenting culture without real people behind them. In contrast, in the seminal diorama, there was an attempt at realism, and yet I think they didn't quite get it right. Uh, the child in particular reminds many of uh, the killer doll, uh, Chucky, from the 1990s horror um, film. The Cheyenne diorama of a family in 1864 along Sand Creek was much more sophisticated in its depiction of uh, indigenous peoples. This one was actually created by a sculptor who was brought in and created the mannequins entirely based on a real family, the Talbull family that was then living, a Cheyenne family that was living in Colorado. But even this one has its limitations. One time, a, a, a Native American in the Denver area came and told me about when he brought his five-year-old nephew to the museum. And our museum is filled with different kinds of dioramas. And so first, they went to the wildlife hall. And they saw uh, one of the last grizzly bears that was in, killed in uh, the Rocky Mountains. And the five-year-old said, is that a real bear? And his, father, or his, his uncle said, yes, that's a real bear. And they moved on to a diorama filled with deer. And the five-year-old said, how did they get those deer in there? And they said, well, they shot, shot and killed them. And then they taxidermied me and put them up there. So you can imagine when he arrived at this diorama, his eyes got big and he broke down into tears. So there's a kind of danger of hyper-realism for native peoples in a natural history museum where all you have is native peoples in relations to dinosaurs and dodos, the last grizzly bear, and taxidermy deer. So maybe you just don't go without any people at all. But to me, these kinds of dioramas are another kind of phantom, presenting culture without people, totally divorcing real people from real things. So that's not a solution either. In our museum, we also have a cigar store Indian, uh, which we also have on display. And of course, this stereotype of Native American identity isn't appropriate for today's museology either. So essentially, we have a kind of dilemma, a predicament for museums in the 21st century, where for 
uh, about 200 years or so, Native Americans have now been presented as objects of study in museums. And yet we now have a goal of not objectifying Native Americans or any people for that matter. And yet when we look at, for example, these dioramas, it's extremely difficult for a museum display not to objectify a people. By definition, we have objects in a display and there's a kind of process of objectification. So I believe if we're going to have a future for museum anthropology, we need to address how native peoples and all peoples that are presented in museums can become subjects in our displays without objectification. So tonight I'm going to try to address this predicament uh, because I think it says a lot not just about our current moment but also about the future of museums. To really understand how we got here, we of course have to understand our past. So I'm going to talk a bit about the history of museums, uh, the processes of uh, colonialism in particular that have played uh, to get us to uh, this historical moment. We've very much changed from, as a discipline from a colonial past into a kind of post-colonial mode that's fundamentally driven by a collaborative ethic. And so I want to lay out the landscape of what that looks like. And yet I want to ask if that is truly enough to move us beyond the colonial history of museums. Do we have all the tools in place to truly overcome a colonial past and move into a post-colonial mode? Part two. So considering the origins of museums, Museums were fundamentally uh, constructed so that objects could be put on display, that all of the world's wonders could be gathered under one roof and presented to the general public. As for this to happen, there was very much a kind of colonial practice and mindset that drove many museums. Essentially, there was a removal of objects from often um, the colonial subjects and the periphery of, of colonies and placed in the metropole for the benefit of people living in large cities. There was also very much a kind of capitalist uh, a practice put in place where essentially any object, anything in the entire world could be alienated, could have a monetary price put on it, could be purchased and taken with, and placed in a museum context. As museums developed, they very much wanted to become a center place of learning and education, which is very positive. But as a part of that, too, they began to express a kind of exclusive authority over the knowledge that was being contained within the institution. Another key part was the, audience, the audiences that arrived in many of these museums were largely passive. They were supposed to be the recipients of this knowledge. Uh, they were largely in urban contexts uh, where there was individuals with wealth and largely uh, white populations. Some of this began to change in the 1900s, uh, in the early 1900s, where museum professionals began to talk about universities, I'm sorry, uh, museums as universities of the common man. So the, the educational goal and, and a kind of inclusiveness beyond the small elite community began to shape museum practices uh, into the early 1900s. And yet, even then, museums were very much about a one-way relationship uh, where museums themselves saw them, uh, perceived themselves as being at the center of this educational experience. And uh, the visitor came as a kind of recipient of knowledge, a kind of vessel to be filled. These practices began to change in the 1900s, but they did not begin to fundamentally change until the 1960s and 70s on the heels of the Civil Rights Movement. During that time, Native Americans began to demand self-determination and self-representation in all kinds of institutions in the United States and beyond. As a part of this, they wanted to have a role in deciding what museums collected as well as what was displayed. This was the foundations of the modern repatriation movement as we know it today. I think a kind of culmination of this moment arrived with an exhibit, uh, excuse me, a performance art piece in 1987 by the Luceno artist James Luna. In this piece, uh, 
Luna took over a section of the San Diego Museum of Man where he put his own life on display. He put on the walls his diplomas, his divorce papers, and different mementos of his life. He then went so far as to literally put his own body on display where you can see the different labels uh, told micro histories of the scars across his body. His point was how the objectification of Native Americans marginalizes living peoples, that this, this, this naturalizing of Native past disregards the, 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 the living, uh, ongoing traditions and identities and perspectives of Native Americans today. At the same time that these sorts of um, uh, social movements were taking place, there were also transformations within the theoretical frameworks of the discipline. Most notably, postmodernism uh, deeply shaped museum theory and analysis, uh, building on M Michel Foucault's ideas of how constructions of knowledge is a way to uh, enforce power structures. Postcolonialism uh, and postcolonial theory also shaped uh, museum analyses. Uh, most notably building on Said's notions of the constructions of the others and how that was a form of domination through colonial and imperial practices. And so it was through the intersection of postmodernism and postcolonial theory that we begin to see museums uh, not just on the ground begin to change, but also in terms of their intellectual mindsets. So by the late 90s, uh, or into the 1990s, we begin to see museums change in fundamental ways. Museums begin to acknowledge that they have a, uh, a need to work with broad, diverse, varied publics, uh, not just urban elite ones. They very much wanted to build in reciprocity, a kind of two-way exchange into museum practices. They also wanted to, within their exhibits and collections, be able to create spaces for different viewpoints and voices and values and perspectives so that it wasn't just, uh, so a museum wasn't just a seat of a single kind of authority, but that there were multiple layers of authority brought into museum practice. And the museum visitor was no longer just supposed to be a vessel to be filled but was actually a participant in the construction of their own experience within the museum setting. And museums became places not just about exhibits or collections or even research, but they became a kind of community building. Museums became a space for relationship work. And so we see this transformation of museums as a one-way uh, relationship between museum and audience to a, a tangled interrelationship between uh, the museum and different publics that was supposed to have some level of equity. We can see this kind of practice put in place with the Arizona State Museum's uh, Paths of Life exhibit, which was completed in 1992, which from beginning to end was co-created with native communities across the Southwest. Uh, they use life models for dioramas as well, echoing uh, our museums and other museums' work uh, to um, create mannequins based on real people. But in this case, the, the community itself wanted this kind of representation and they sought it out. And so the museum was working with the community to implement it. So museums into the late 90s and early 2000s became places that were very much not, not about trying to be the sole authority, not trying to uh, have the sole voice, but being a place where all of these different issues of economics and power and representation could be dealt with. Uh, these weren't places, you didn't go to the museum to have these questions answered, but you went to museums to have these questions negotiated. Theoretically framing much of this movement was uh, Mary Louise Pratt's notion uh, via uh, uh, Clifford, James Clifford, around the contact zone, which is essentially a kind of meeting place uh, where different cultures come and clash and grapple with each other's realities 
often in asymmetrical power uh, contexts, such as colonialism. Uh, Gwen Isaac and others have also talked about museums at this time being a kind of mediating space, again, negotiating all these different and complex issues. Part three. So today we've seen a fundamental transformation of what museums can be and often what they are. Uh, the, the museum field is very much defined by this collaborative ethic, this idea of building partnerships and relationships with source communities, with different kinds of stakeholders. And we can trace this, this kind of broad uh, movement towards collaboration in all kinds, these are just a, a small handful, in all kinds of writings that exist, whether we're talking explicitly about theory or practice, display, collections work, uh, basically, uh, the collaborative ethic totally suffuses now, at least at the high level of uh, museum anthropology today. We can see this on the ground in places like the National Museum of the American Indian. This is a controversial institution in some ways that's been heavily critiqued, and yet, in a very basic way, the the practice of a museum identifying individual community members that co-create exhibits is a model that's used throughout the museum world today. And these kinds of, um, these kinds of uh, practices don't just involve exhibits, but also involve collections. The uh, reciprocal research network uh, out of the University of British Columbia's Museum of Anthropology is one of the prime examples. Uh, they work with 27 different institutions to uh, present Northwest Coast art and artifacts and allow uh, native uh, communities and community members to have access to those databases and to help contribute their own knowledge to it. And then that becomes a foundation for different kinds of research projects. These types of revolutions uh, have very much informed the work at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where I'm a curator. Uh, the museum was founded in 1900 and has long served the uh, community of Denver. In 1935, the Department of Archaeology was formed, and that was really the beginning of the human story being told at the museum. This was uh, then amplified in 1968 when the museum received a gift of a 12,000 piece collection, which really changed the ability of the museum to tell the human story. In 1968, the museum began to uh, build a permanent hall based on this 12,000 piece collection. And in the 1970s, it began to run into some trouble when the American Indian movement, a sort of radical pan-Indian political group, began to insist, insist that it wanted to have a role in museum practices in the Denver area. They even went so far, the AIM members in Denver went so far as to invade a, a, a lab at Colorado State University where they performed a citizen's arrest on an archeologist uh, because that archaeologist had just dug up some uh, graves, some Native American graves. They then uh, took those collections and said that they were going to rebury them. However, the professor then later said, who escaped the citizen's arrest, later said that those remains weren't of Native Americans, that they were of, uh, there were zoological collections and others. And so eventually they were returned. But this was a kind of foreshadowing of the demands of Native peoples who wanted a role in the museum world in, in Denver and beyond. And so um, in response, in 1973, the museum created an advisory council of Native Americans to help guide the evolution of the permanent exhibit uh, and to uh, help bless the, uh, the, the permanent hall once it opened. The museum was very much in tune with Native American, urban Native American concerns when the exhibit opened in 1978. 
It held uh, different kinds of symposia on topics like land rights, poverty, alcoholism. They talked about the American Indian Religious and um, Freedom Act and other kinds of laws that were empowering Native peoples at that time. They were very much focused on the urban experience and wanted to respond to the Native community. And there was this kind of pulse of in deep engagement with the Native community. And it didn't last, but at least it, it provided a kind of example of what was possible in the museum. The museum has a long and tangled relationship with repatriation and the demands for sacred objects and ancestral remains. Uh, but at least in 1990, the museum very much embraced the potential of NAGPRA. They wanted to do the right thing. They worked hard uh, to follow the law and return what the law required. So in 2007, when I arrived at the museum, we very much wanted to build on these traditions. Uh, at our museum, as well as many others throughout the country, but also expand on them and deepen them in some way. We came up with this aspiration statement uh, as a kind of signpost or goal for ourselves, acknowledging that it would be very difficult, but nonetheless something to aspire to. And we the key phrases here are really that we wanted to focus on stewardship and our role of stu as stewards and the idea that we had a responsibility to have a kind of intellectual uh, framework around the objects that we curate, as well as a deep commitment to ethical practices. So we first created something called the Native Sciences Initiative, and this had many different programs under this umbrella. Uh, starting in 2008, we began offering uh, scholarships to Native American college students pursuing a science career. We offer three internships to Native American uh, students every year. We have a science career, we had a science career day for a number of years where we introduced Native American scientists in the Denver area to Native youth uh, to try to inspire them towards a science career. And we have workshops around technology and culture as well. We created a, um, I'm sorry, we participated in a uh, film festival that that presents Native American films, often by filmmakers, monthly. We've been doing that for a number of years. And we also created the Visiting Indigenous Fellowship Program for Native artists to come and use the collections to either uh, be, to use it for inspiration for their own art, or maybe it's an elder that wants to reconnect with uh, some pieces that a grandmother made. It can really be anything around the needs of an individual wanting to use the museum as a resource. Uh, we were lucky to have James Luna, uh, who created the artifact piece. He came a few years ago and created an installation and performed at our, at our museum as well. Like the Reciprocal Research Network, we developed our own uh, project in collaboration with the uh, Ashi, Ashiawan Museum and Heritage Center based out of the Zuni tribe in New Mexico. And this is similar to the Reciprocal Research Network, but instead of being based out of the museum, this actually originated out of the tribe itself. And the tribe basically wanted to have a database that was to benefit its own tribal members. So they reached out to different museums, ours was one of them, and created a network of different databases so that tribal members could see what museums had because they're unlikely to travel to England and LA and Denver to see everything that their ancestors had made. And at the same time, they didn't want the information within this database to reflect only outsider museological perspectives. So the entire database was structured and framed around Zuni values, Zuni uh, terminology, Zuni perspectives. And additionally, then Zunis could uh, comment through text as well as video and audio. So this was very much an experiment of uh, collection database work, but really providing the tools to the tribe itself so that they could create a database that truly served their own needs. We've also been deeply engaged on repatriation work. Uh, when I came to the museum, we were out of compliance with NAGPRA. And so within a year, we had the museum back on track. And a lot of that involved 
uh, acknowledging many of the legitimate claims that were placed for a number of objects, such as these from the Clinket. We also worked on a number of repatriations outside of the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, the 1990 federal law that establishes a process for Native peoples to claim uh, different kinds of cultural items. We had our board approve within our collection policy a commitment to deal with repatriation through uh, respect and reciprocity and justice and dialogue as kind of our guiding virtues for any kind of claim that would be placed on us. We have had several opportunities to put this in practice, most notably several years ago when we returned uh, 30 of these wooden memorial statues called Vagongo, which, were, which are placed on, at the edge of a hamlet in communities in rural Kenya and Tanzania. And these memorial statues essentially are communally owned. No one has the right to alienate them. But in the 1980s, a dealer began to have uh, youth who were desperate for money steal these for about $7 a piece. He then brought them to the US largely and uh, sold them for thousands of dollars. So these were clearly stolen items. Uh, and so we worked with the uh, Kenyan government as well as the, uh, here's Denver's mayor and a councilman and our, our museum president and CEO in order to facilitate a repatriation to the Mijikenda in Kenya. We've also been very much focused on human remains and the need to proactively address the disposition of those collections. We started out holding consultations with tribes in different regions in the United States. So we first met with tribes in the Rocky Mountain region and then the Midwest and then the East Coast. And we basically facilitated consultations and agreements with all those tribes across the US. We then were left with about 20 individuals who we knew were Native American, but we didn't know what tribe. This is a very complicated process under NAGPRA. NAGPRA, in fact, doesn't really even have very good guidance on how to deal with very broad categories of native identity but lack tribal identity. So what we did was we decided we would need to try to consult with all, then there were 566 federally recognized tribes. So we spent several years uh, building regional consultations and working through all the issues with as many tribes that wanted to participate as they could. And we again came up with an agreement. What was left was human remains that lacked consent, either from the individual kin or community, uh, but, and we believed were not Native American, but we felt we still had something to do something proactively to address the ethical question of how we should care for these remains. So we, uh, as my boss, uh, Steve Nash here on the left likes to say, uh, we held a bad bar joke. We invited a Catholic priest and a rabbi and an imam, uh, uh, several scientists, um, uh, a few agnostics, an atheist, and we got them all in a room together. We presented them with this collection and we held an interfaith uh, consultation. And from that agreement, uh, we then reburied the individuals at a natural cemetery in the Rocky Mountains. So this emergent collaborative ethic uh, has a few defining features to it. The first is that museums are working to provide access to these communities that have long been excluded from uh, the, the uh, exhibiting and collecting work that museums do. We're also working to create opportunities for communities to actively participate in this process so that they themselves have a role and they get to define their own role as well. And then finally, how things are interpreted, how things are presented, what the meanings of things truly are. Museums are, many museums are moving to a kind of multivocality, a, um, a fluorescence of many voices presenting different levels of an, and different kinds of interpretations of, of objects. So part four.
despite all of our hard work, the dummies are still in the exhibit hall. The mannequins are still there. And to me, this goes to the question of how persistent the roots of colonialism can be. You know, there's, in Colorado, you might have it here, there's this weed that's the most phenomenal plant I've ever seen. And it finds a way to grow in little tiny cracks. And all it needs is just a little bit of time, and then it plants itself. And it's impossible to pick. You pick the top of it, and the roots are still there. And it grows in a tree, and you cut it down as far as you can. And the roots just won't go away. And from those roots, over and over, the plant grows and grows and grows. And this, I think, is a metaphor for colonialism, where we think we have cut some of these practices from centuries past off, and yet they persist. There's a vitally important paper that was published in Museum Anthropology by Robin Boast in 2011, where he talks about how museums have used this framework of the contact zone, uh, Mary Louise Pratt's notion, where they emphasize the contact zone as a kind of positive um, way of thinking about museums today. And there's several parts to the contact zone as Pratt conceived it. The first is what's, what's called transculturation, or how different cultures basically transpose their different parts and come together. But there's a second, and that's what most people talk about. But there's a second part that almost no one else talks about. And for Pratt, that's what she called autoethnography. And the basic idea is that the colonized, in order to speak to the colonizer, have to speak in terms that only the colonizer will understand. And so what people do on the periphery, people who are being colonized, is they have to find a language that can express themselves in a way that's legible and legitimate to the colonizer. And no one's talking about that, and yet that's very much, arguably, a part of ongoing museum practices today. Last month, there was an anti-Columbus Day uh, uh, protest at the American Museum of Natural History. A great museum, a great institution, which is doing many of these practices of the, you know, working towards a kind of collaborative practice. And yet, in this protest, the, the, these 200 people were able to go to 10 different parts of the museum and find the legacies of white supremacy, very evident, not erased. And nothing embodied that more than this 1939 statue of our 26th president, Teddy Roosevelt. Here he, he sits astride a stallion uh, with an African American down on one side and a Native American on the other. And the symbolic resonance of that is very powerful given Roosevelt's writings himself about white supremacy and about the need to dominate different races of the world. A key part of how these colonial practices are maintained is through what Onkiel calls uh, naturalized inequalities. That there are inequalities that persist in museum practices that we don't even notice, we don't even attempt to regulate or consider, because we just consider it a part of what we do. It's a part of our everyday practice. Of course, we put things in cabinets. Of course, we, um, pay, we have people pay for admission. You know, the kinds of things that are just a natural part of the museum practice are totally normalized so that we don't challenge them in any fundamental ways. A key part of this argument is that the inequalities that we see in museums aren't just in museums, but surround us in larger social, political, and economic structures. So we can think, for example, about just some very basic statistics of Native American life in the United States today. Look at things like graduation rates or life expectancy. The top five categories of, of groups most likely to be killed by the police, of those five, three are Native American groups. If we think about economics, my museum has a budget of $36 million. We have about 300 employees. Uh, we do important work, I think, but we are a kind of add-on to the educational structure in our city. Compare that to the Hopi tribe, which has 10,000 tribal members, and their government has to provide 
basic services to the entire membership on 21 million. So I see these kind of uh, persistent practices of colonialism seeping into museums, even in this, collab this moment of, and the celebrated moment of collaboration. First is that museums continue to retain control, almost always, over money and resources. Native peoples might be invited in as collaborators, but it's the museums that, are contr that have the purse, uh, control the purse and decide who is getting what for how much. And in the control of resources is a mechanism of power that's leveraged over Native communities. Secondly, we, consider, we continue to struggle to bring in Native uh, professionals, academics, and also Native audiences. Um, I was uh, really excited to see how the Hales, and Edward Hale in particular, was really focused on encouraging Native students to become, uh, act, you know, become uh, active students here, become students at Brown as well as elsewhere. And this is something that we continue to uh, need to work on. It's not happening enough. I don't think we need a discipline that's only dominated by Native people. But certainly, if Native people aren't in the room, then it's that much harder for a Native voice to be present. Thirdly, many of these programs advance the goals of museums without advancing the goals of the communities. So often at what we see out of these collaborative relationships is the museum may get a new exhibit, the museum may get help in reinterpreting its database. It might present a lecture. You know, we presented James Luna. You know, we, we served our audiences. But how are those practices really benefiting the Native communities? Those benefits reap, uh, are reaped to individuals as well, as much as institutions. And so we need to really rethink what we mean by reciprocity and by what we mean by sharing the benefits and ensuring a two-way flow between museums and the communities we want to serve. Fourth, the rewards within many museum systems disfavor deep collaboration. And what I mean by that is like at my museum, we are evaluated on publications, which uh, the, the more senior authorship that you have, the better. Right? So if I'm the first author on a peer-reviewed paper, I get more credit than if I'm a second or third or fourth. Or if I don't write a paper at all, but perhaps I do something that is very meaningful to the community and that benefits them, those things I don't get credit for. We also, in museums often, especially research museums like mine, still embrace a narrative of discovery. You know, most of the scientists can make the you know, front page of our local or even national paper if they make a big discovery around science, which is great. But in anthropology, and particularly in collabor collaborative anthropology, it's hard to make discoveries. So fitting our narrative of success in collaboration into the existent reward systems is very difficult. And I think that essentially discourages many anthropologists from pursuing these kinds of collaborative works. And lastly, we don't tackle often enough the issues that are important to the communities that we want to connect with. We can think of, for example, the Dakota Access Pipeline issue going on right now. And some of you might have seen there actually is a petition going around of several, now several thousand museum professionals and anthropologists who've signed as archaeologists as well who've signed it and are trying to help take a stand on this social issue. Uh, but that's the exception rather than the rule. And so I think if we want to be meaningful to communities, we need to identify the issues that are meaningful to them and begin to tackle them. This is a provocative and powerful statement by Jim Enote, the director of the Ashiwi Awan Museum and Heritage Center. And he emphasizes that what we need is a much more genuine, reliable, and virtuous kind of collaboration. Collaboration that's truly based on virtues such as trust and honesty and listening. He thinks that this is a collaboration of a kind of higher order that we need to strive for. Essentially, that in order to avoid a kind of cloaked uh, colonialism that's cloaked by uh, collaborative practices, we really need to 
delve into what he describes as a kind of pure collaboration, something that most fundamentally is two-way based on reciprocity and ensures that native peoples are truly heard, that their perspectives are truly included in museum practices. So in conclusion, what does all this mean for the diorama dilemma? Well, I think if we look at how we're going to uh, create new dioramas that truly embrace this notion of a kind of pure collaboration, I don't have the answer because it's dependent on the communities themselves. They need to have a voice in identifying how they want to be represented. But there is a project that we've had that I think allows a kind of window into where we might head. And that is our Native Science at DMNS project, our workshop in 2010, which was uh, created by a Kiowa a PhD student at the University of Colorado in the computer science program. And Calvin had a vision of, of bringing together technology, science, and culture, and creating a kind of venue for Native youth and their allies to um, to have a better foundation in all those fields and also try to unite them in a unique way. And so as a project, uh, he brought together a native uh, high school teacher, a native intern, and 10 native students uh, in the Denver area. And they created a online platform that, that is a kind of lens to the Cheyenne diorama. And this was a way for them to create a voice and a perspective around the diorama. But the point I want to end on is that uh, just recently, Calvin and I worked on a paper, uh, and we submitted it to Museum Anthropology. It's going to appear uh, shortly. But one of their viewers uh, in this paper had a question. And the question was, this project clearly did not change any kind of fundamental practice at the museum. Nothing really changed. It was really almost kind of a one-off. It was an experiment in a pilot project. And so this reviewer asked, well, if nothing's really changed fundamentally for the museum, then how can you say this project was a success? And that's a good question, but Calvin's response was the benefits weren't supposed to go to the museum. The benefits were supposed to go to the Native students, to the community members themselves. And so to conclude, I want to say that I think they're both right. I think museum, museums and museum professionals, we need to continue to look inward, to look at how we can continue to change in fundamental ways. But at the same time, we need to look at the horizon far beyond the walls of museums. Thank you.